Ah. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have to tell you, this room is either really hot or really cold. So right now, hopefully you have a little fan on and you can um, fan yourselves. Um, I'm Kelly Darnell. I'm interim CEO and chief operating officer at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And we, it is a pleasure for us to be able to host you this morning. We are really excited about this event. Um, we've been excited for several weeks now, and we're glad that we are finally able to get it together in person and not virtual. Um, for over a decade, BPC has been, in, has been active on financial regulatory issues and has examined a wide range of topics, including Dodd-Frank, small business lending, artificial intelligence, and digital assets, just to name a few. Today, we're going to look into the issue of capital requirements in Basel III, a topic at the center of many financial regulation, regulatory debates. Our featured speaker and very distinguished guest is Mr. Michael Barr, Vice Chair and Super for Supervision of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He also serves as a member of the Board of Governors for an unexpired term ending January 2032. Prior to his appointment to the Board of Governors, Mr. Barr was the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan, the Frank Murphy Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, the Roy F. and Jean Humphrey Profit Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School, and the Founder and Faculty Director of the University of Michigan Center on Finance, Law, and Policy. Mr. Barr served as the U.S. Tre Department of Treasury's Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions from 2009 to 2010. Under President Bill Clinton, Mr. Barr served as the Treasury Secretary's Special Assistant, Deputy S Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Special Advisor to the President, and Special Advisor and Counselor on the Policy Planning Staff at the U.S. Department of State. I'm fumbling over these, Mr. Barr, because there's so many accolades in here. <laughs> uh, it's a lot to get out. Additionally, Mr. Barr served as a law clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice David Souter and the honor honorable peer level of the Southern District of New York. Mr. Barr received his B.A. in History from Yale, his Master's in International Relations from Oxford, and his J.D. from Yale Law School. Following Vice Chair, the Vice Chair's remarks, he'll be joined by Nick Tamaros, the Chief Economics Correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, for a moderated discussion. We will be taking questions from the audience, so please think about what questions you would like to ask and prepare um, for that moment in the schedule. And then, of course, we're going to have a moderated discussion um, at following our, Mr. Barr's remarks. Again, I want to thank you for being here. This is a very special event for BPC, and we look forward to having policymakers come to BPC to give their policy remarks, um, because as you know, we try to, in our bipartisan effort, um, bring both sides discuss both, dis both sides of debate, and we're really pleased that you could come and that you've chosen BPC to give your remarks. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for, uh, for the warm introduction, and thank you for the warm welcome here uh, to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm here to report on my holistic review of capital for large banks and to outline steps that I believe are appropriate to update our capital standards so that banks can continue to serve our communities, households, and businesses. A more detailed version of these remarks is available on the Fed's website, in case any of you are thinking my remarks are too short today. <laughs> uh, the review is a top priority because capital is fundamental to safety and soundness. I approach the task with humility. We need to be skeptical about the ability of bank managers or regulators to anticipate all emerging risks. Events over the past few months have only reinforced the need for humility and skepticism, and for an approach that makes banks resilient to both familiar and unanticipated risks. Instead of trying to design rules to address every conceivable risk, regulators must focus broadly on resilience. 
ensuring that banks and the financial system can withstand challenges wherever they emerge and however they are transmitted through the system. Fortunately, there is a component of bank funding, equity capital, that is well suited to building resilience. Whatever the vulnerability or the shock, capital is able to help absorb the resulting loss and, if sufficient, allow the bank to keep serving its critical role in the economy. I initiated a review of capital standards as one of my first actions as vice chair for supervision. The review was focused on capital requirements for large banks with more than $100 billion in total assets. A holistic approach is important because the requirements function as a system. Each component treats risks and associated capital needs differently, but all components together result in a certain amount of capital required. To that end, over the last nine months, I have engaged with a wide range of parties from the public and private sectors and academia to get a broad perspective on how the Fed's capital standards interact with each other and the result they together achieve. In the midst of this review, we once again learned the importance of resilience when a sudden bank run and contagion caused three large banks to fail, and we experienced significant stress in the banking system, stemmed only by invocation of the systemic risk exception and creation of an emergency lending facility. This should make us very humble indeed. I reviewed whether changes would be appropriate to better align capital requirements with risk taking to help ensure that our banking system is sufficiently resilient to serve its vital role in our economy. Any proposed changes would go through the standard notice and comment rulemaking process, allowing all interested parties ample time to weigh in on the proposed changes. Any final changes to capital requirements would occur with appropriate transition times. I will be pursuing further changes to regulation and supervision in response to the recent banking stress including how we regulate and supervise liquidity, interest rate risk, and incentive compensation, as well as improving improving the speed, agility, and force of the Federal Reserve's supervision. I expect to have more to say on these topics in the coming months. Let me uh, begin by talking about uh, multiple measures of risk we use in the capital system. Our system of capital requirements uses multiple measures of risk which work collectively to achieve an overall level of resilience. We have a set of risk-based requirements that are based on the risk of a bank's activities and a set of non-risk-sensitive backstops. And we use stress testing as a complement to point-in-time capital requirements. Stress tests measure banks' resilience against a hypothetical shock. These equity capital requirements are complemented by long-term debt requirements, which help provide an additional cushion to resolve a bank that has entered resolution. These multiple ways of measuring and mitigating risk are helpful for the resiliency of banks and the robustness of the system. Any single way of measuring bank risk would miss or underplay some aspect of risk, and each of the different approaches tends to measure risk not captured or measured well by the others. Further, a capital framework with multiple ways of measuring risk is harder for banks to gain. Of course, there are also downsides to having multiple approaches to measuring risk in calculating capital requirements. The greater complexity itself introduces risk. But on balance, I think multiple approaches are warranted. An important aspect of my proposals will be to implement the changes to the risk-based capital requirements referred to as the Basel III endgame, which are intended to ensure that our minimum capital requirements require banks to hold adequate capital against their risk-taking. There was a consensus among the Basel jurisdictions that current rules underestimate risks for the largest, most complex banks. The international agreement to implement these reforms was finalized more than five years ago in 2017, and I am pleased that we are beginning the process to implement the reforms. First, for a firm's lending activities, the proposed rules would end the practice of relying on banks' own individual estimates of their own risk instead use a standardized measure of credit risk. Standardized credit risk approaches appear to do a reasonably good job of approximating risks. And we have the additional rigor of a supervisory stress test to assess the credit risk of lending activities. Second, for a firm's trading activities, the proposed rules would adjust the way that a firm measures market risk, which is the risk of loss from movement in market prices. These changes would raise market risk capital requirements 
by correcting for gaps in the current rules. For instance, the proposal would require banks to model market risk at the level of individual trading desks, which will better reflect the observation that correlation across risk can change dramatically in times of stress. The proposal would require banks to use a standardized approach for hard to model risk, which is appropriate in light of the weaknesses that were exposed in the 2008 financial crisis when many firms did not have acceptable models for their risks. In addition, the proposal appropriately charges more capital for positions that are less liquid in order to better capture the risks of illiquid trading positions. Third, for operational losses such as trading losses or litigation expenses, the proposed rules would replace an internal modeled operational risk requirement with a standardized measure. The proposal would approximate a firm's operational risk charge based on the firm's activities and adjust the charge upward based on a firm's historical operational losses to add risk sensitivity and provide firms with an incentive to mitigate their operational risk. One important question involves the size of institutions that the new risk-based capital rules should apply to. And I will recommend that the enhanced capital rules apply to banks and bank holding companies with 100 billion or more in assets. Expanding the scope of application for the enhanced rules is appropriate for two reasons. First, the proposed rules are less burdensome for banks to implement than the current requirements, since they don't require a bank to develop a suite of internal credit risk and operational risk models to calculate regulatory capital. Second, our recent experience shows that even banks of this size can cause stress that spreads to other institutions and threatens financial stability. The enhancements to the capital rule should improve the resilience of these firms. Importantly, the proposed adjustments would require banks with assets of 100 billion or more to account for unrealized losses and gains in their available for sale securities when calculating their regulatory capital. This change would improve the transparency of regulatory capital ratios, since it would better reflect banking organizations' actual loss-absorbing capacity. These changes would increase capital requirements overall, but I want to emphasize that they would principally raise capital requirements for the largest, most complex banks. More broadly, recall that banks are, by nature, very leveraged and fund only a small portion of their assets with capital. One can think of the proposal's more accurate risk measures as equivalent to requiring the largest banks to hold an additional two percentage points of capital, or an additional $2 of capital for every $100 of risk-weighted assets as currently measured. While this increase in requirements could lead to some changes in bank activities, the benefits of making the financial system more resilient to stresses that could otherwise impair growth are greater. That is not to ignore concerns that changes in capital requirements may cause firms to change their behavior and the way that financial services are provided to our economy. We intend to consider comments carefully, and any changes would be implemented with appropriate phase-ins. This phase-in will allow ample time for banks to adjust their balance sheets and activities and to build capital over time. In fact, most banks already have enough capital today to meet the new requirements. For the banks that would need to build capital to meet the requirements, assuming that they continue to earn money at the same rate as in recent years, we estimate that banks would be able to build the requisite capital through retained earnings in less than two years, even while maintaining their dividends. As part of the holistic review, I have also evaluated the board's stress testing framework. In particular, I've considered whether the proposed changes to the risk-based capital framework should prompt adjustment to stress testing, and whether there are ways the stress test itself can be improved to make it a more effective test of bank resilience. I have concluded that the framework for stress testing generally remains sound, but that we should review our global market shock and the stress test approach to estimating operational risk so that they provide a complementary lens to our risk-based standards on market risk and operational risk, respectively. Banks have raised concerns that the changes to the risk-based capital framework I described earlier, combined with the stress test, result in double counting of risk that is already captured in the minimum requirements. Conceptually, this should not be the case, as the changes in the risk-based capital requirements affect the way that minimum capital requirements are calculated, and the stress test is used to calculate the buffer. But we will seek comments on all elements of the proposed risk-based capital adjustments including whether interaction with the stress test results in an appropriate 
treatment. 14 years of stress testing and the real life surprises during that time, including the pandemic and the bank stresses this spring, have made it clear that stress tests need to be stressful to adequately prepare banks for, un, for unanticipated events. A key strength of stress testing is its ability to be responsive to the rapidly changing conditions by testing bank resilience to emerging or growing risks. In addition, stress testing can be used to assess banks' resilience to different kinds of stresses in the system. For example, we have long known, and the recent experience with SVB reinforced, the importance of banks' resilience to funding stresses. The stress test should continue to evolve to better capture the range of salient risks that banks face. In addition, the board could use a range of exploratory scenarios to assess banks' resilience to an evolving set of risks and use the results to inform supervision. As part of the holistic review, I have evaluated whether proposed changes to the risk-based capital framework should prompt revisions to the GSIB surcharge. I am not recommending fundamental changes to the underlying framework at this time, but I will be recommending a series of adjustments of a more technical nature, including adjustments to limit so-called window dressing, reduce cliff effects in the GSIB surcharge, and improve how we measure some systemic indicators to better align them with risk. These changes would ensure that the GSIB surcharge better reflects the systemic risk of each bank. As part of the holistic review, I've also evaluated whether to adjust the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio. Some have argued that when banks are close to the ESLR as a binding constraint, it has reduced treasury market intermediation. The evidence on that is inconclusive. To the extent it matters, the revisions in risk-based capital requirements I discussed today would mean that the ESLR generally would not act as the binding constraint at the holding company level where treasury intermediation occurs. To the extent that there are problems with treasury market intermediation in the future for which the ESLR might matter, the board could consider an adjustment. A related proposal to these on capital will be to introduce a long-term debt requirement for all large banks. Long-term debt improves the ability of a bank to be resolved upon failure because the long-term debt can be converted to equity and used to absorb losses. Such a measure would reduce losses borne by the FDIC's deposit insurance fund and provide the FDIC with additional options for restructuring, selling, or winding down a failed bank. I support applying a long-term debt requirement to all institutions with $100 billion or more in assets. This would add an important safeguard to a class of banks that came under pressure this spring after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. If SVB had enough long-term debt outstanding, it might have reduced the risk of a run by uninsured depositors, and it might have given the FDIC more options to resolve the bank or merge it with a healthy institution. And importantly, more, more long-term debt at SVB would also have reduced the cost to the FDIC of its resolution. All of these factors would have reduced the risk of contagion to other banks. The comprehensive set of proposals that I have described here today would significantly strengthen our financial system and prepare it for emerging and unanticipated risks, such as those that manifested themselves in the banking system earlier this year. The holistic review began well before then, of course, and the steps proposed here address shortcomings in capital standards did not, did not begin in March of 2023. But in an obvious way, the failure of SVB and other banks this spring were warning signs that banks need to be more resilient and need more of what is the foundation of that resilience, which is capital. Some industry representatives claim that inadequate capital had nothing to do with those bank failures. I disagree. It was an unsuccessful attempt by SVB to raise capital that caused uninsured depositors to look more closely at how the bank was capitalized. Some industry representatives have claimed that SVB's problems were really related to poor management and shortcomings in the Federal Reserve supervision. Indeed, those findings were thoroughly documented in a report I released in May, and steps by the Fed to address those issues will be announced in the coming months. But it is not logical to argue that failings in supervision must mean that SVB was adequately capitalized. It wasn't. Or that supervision by itself can somehow assure safety and soundness throughout the banking system. It is not a choice between supervision and capital regulation. Capital is and has always been the foundation of a bank's safety and soundness.
Some industry representatives have claimed that raising capital requirements will push activity outside of the regulated financial sector. As I discussed in my speech on capital last December, we need to worry a lot about non-bank risk to financial stability. The answer, however, is not lower capital requirements for banks, but more attention to those very risks. Further, as stress in non-bank financial markets is often transmitted to the banking system, both directly and indirectly, it is critical that banks have enough capital to remain resilient to those stresses. For the reasons I've outlined today, we need to strengthen capital standards for large banks. That process will be deliberative and open to public participation, and implementation of any changes agreed to will take at least several years, which is why it's so important to begin now. Everyone in America depends on a safe and stable financial system. By strengthening capital standards, we are ensuring that businesses have credit to grow and hire workers and deal with the ups and downs of the economy. Stronger capital standards mean workers can depend on getting their paychecks and families can save and borrow to plan for the future. Our goal is a financial system that works for everyone, and having strong capital rules is essential for that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, to reintroduce myself, I'm Nick Timros from the Wall Street Journal. Um, we're gonna do questions with Michael right now. I think in the audience here, uh, you should have a note card. If you want to submit a question, um, folks from the BPC will be running those up to me. So think of your question and hand them off to a runner. Um, and while we wait for those, I will ask a few of my own. Um, so Michael, um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you think back, you know, you proposed this review, of course, before the events of SVB. But I'm wondering if you can walk us through what parts of your proposals today uh, perhaps changed because of the events we saw after Silicon Valley Bank's failure in March. Thanks, Nick. Well, let me just say, first of all, uh, the, as you said, the, the, the work that we did, um, that we started on reviewing capital standards began when I arrived uh, in July of, of last year at the Fed. I said I was going to conduct this holistic review because I think it's important for anyone in a job like mine taking on the vice chair role to to get a full picture of the system. Um, a lot of the changes that we're talking about with respect to uh, the Basel III implementation uh, are, are not about the narrow issues at, at play in the events of, of, of March of, of, of this year. But I do think that the events of this year reinforce the need for strong capital in the system. I think the events of this spring also suggest the need to think broadly about systemic risk. I think you know, s m many people thought of systemic risk as being just about the globally systemically important banks and not about other institutions that were large and could, could pro cause problems. I, I think that was a mistake. I mean, I, I said so back in, in 2015 and in 2016 and 2017, you need to think broadly in the system about the way that risk can propagate. And what we saw in the spring was contagion um, from one very large bank to other large, other large bank. And that suggests that because of that systemic risk, our models of we use for loss given default and probability default, and you multiply those together, and that gives you a sense of the exposure of the financial system. It suggests that we need to be careful in thinking about taking into account contagion from other firms in, in doing so. So that basic backstop, um, uh, uh, background to the rulemaking led us to, to make certain adjustments. So for example, uh, we include in the Basel III proposal uh, all firms with $100 billion or more in assets, not just the globally systemically important banks. And we do that in part to make sure that those institutions have the resilience they need, including uh, after an appropriate uh, rulemaking and, and appropriate transition process, bringing in unrealized uh, losses and gains on securities into their capital treatment. We're also um, proposing uh, a long-term debt requirement for firms at that same size level, 100 billion and above, 
And so those are two examples of, in a very concrete way, of how the events in March um, changed our thinking about how to put this package of rules together. And so on that point, one of the critiques I hear from bank executives of uh, some of these proposals you have announced today around capital comes down to, well, we at the Fed can't do our job on supervising asset liability mismatch, so we're going to smash you with more capital. What would be your response to that critique? You know, I, I've, I've also heard that uh, you, you won't be surprised to hear. Um, look, c capital is not about smashing anything. Capital is about building resilience in the financial system. Capital is what enables banks to lend to the economy. And so we want banks with the appropriate level of capital. The, the Basel III reforms make important adjustments, uh, for example, to uh, the way in which um, trading activity is measured and make adjustments so that the capital measures the underlying risk uh, associated with those trading activities. That's a good thing to do for the resilience of, of the banking system. Of course, we also want to address supervision. Uh, supervision and regulation go hand in hand. Uh, I have been very clear that we are going to do that. Uh, we're engaged in a process uh, to improve the force and the speed and the agility of supervision in appropriate cases. Lots of times supervision is working just fine, uh, but we want to make sure that supervisors have the tools they need when it isn't working the way it's supposed to, to step in and be able to act quickly uh, so that uh, problems do not become uh, deeper at an institution. So I assume a lot of analysis went into ensuring that these capital requirements are properly calibrated. Uh, will that analysis be made uh, available to the public? Yes, yeah, so as, as a normal part of rulemaking process, anything that we propose, including the elements that I've just described, those will go through normal notice and comment rulemaking. And in the no that normal notice and comment rulemaking, there is an extensive material analyzing why the changes are important and what their impact would be. And we will also, associated with the Basel III a proposal, uh, conduct additional impact analysis, update our impact analysis as uh, we move forward before we finalize a rule. So the public will be able to be engaged uh, the financial sector will be able to comment. Public interest groups will be able to comment. Members of Congress can provide comment. And, and we welcome those. Uh, you know, the whole point of having a, a notice and comment rulemaking process uh, that way is to make sure we have the facts right, to make sure we understand uh, what the impact will be. And, and so we, we very much welcome public input into that. You talked about the phase in for this process and how it should be uh, r relatively straightforward for banks that can't satisfy these rules today to do so under retained earnings over a couple of years. Of course, we're heading into bank earnings period in a couple of weeks here, and I wonder, you know, there was a baseline assumption that higher rates, interest rates are good for banks because uh, even if they face unrealized losses on their asset side, uh, their deposit franchise becomes more valuable, and so the unrealized gains offset. Have the events of the past few months changed uh, your thinking around this to, any, to an extent? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I do think that the basic model is still the case. That is, in a rising interest rate environment in general, um, banks have unrealized losses uh, on their books, but the economic value of their equity goes up, the franchise value of the firm goes up, because they're able to continue to have funding that is lower cost funding in a rising rate environment. and they're able to uh, reprice uh, loans on the asset side of the balance sheet at the same time. That basic model is still the case. But the recent banking stress has uh, changed the calculus a bit for some firms. So some firms are now paying up uh, more for deposits um, than they otherwise would have had to do. And that, that may, for, again, for some firms, squeeze net interest margin in ways that it in, in a normal cycle it would not have. So we are paying careful attention to that. Uh, I know that uh, the, the market pays careful attention to that as well. And um, we, you know, we, we look at that as part of our supervisory process when we look at interest rate risk facing, facing a bank. So assuming for the moment that bank mergers could actually get done in this environment because of some of the capital challenges uh, 
uh, investment challenges for the, for the banking industry. Who, who do you agree with more on bank merger policy right now? Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who says more mergers might be the best way out of the current mess, or Jonathan Cantor and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren, who have been uh, calling for greater scrutiny of bank mergers? Well, let me, let me not comment on either of those individuals. <laughs> you don't like the framing of that. <laughs> I tried. But, but you yeah, know, it was a, it was a I, I like that, Nick. But um, uh, let me just say, you know, broadly speaking, that uh, I think mergers uh, can be um, a useful and important part of any vibrant uh, sector, including the financial services sector. Uh, we have statutory factors we look at um, when we review mergers. We look at the effect on competition. We, looked at, we look at financial stability. We look at convenience and needs. We look at financial and managerial resources. And, and we stand ready to do that uh, when banks come forward with a merger application. I guess what I've heard is that the signals sometimes are unclear from uh, this administration or the Fed about how supportive they would be of bank mergers right now. Well, you know, I can say last fall when I first arrived, we, we had a, a few month process that resulted in uh, the, the approval of a, a very large bank merger by, by U.S. Bank. Um, so I, I think the evidence is we, we know how to do mergers when they're appropriate and they go through their, our process and they meet, they meet the statutory factors and, and we would do that for any, for any bank. Uh, the Fed, of course, is a very consensus-driven institution, um, and even though dissents have generally been rare on monetary policy, they're less rare on regulatory policy. One of your colleagues, Governor Bowman, sounds like she might dissent against some of your proposals on capital here. And my question, Michael, is what steps have you or will you take to try to secure close to unanimous support for what you're proposing today? Well, Nick, uh, you know, I, I very much believe in the collegial nature of the Federal Reserve. Um, I think it's an important uh, way that we work together as colleagues. Uh, we meet regularly, all of the board members in individual groupings, um, not, not all together, um, but in, in uh, one-on-one -on -one settings. I meet with, uh, with the chair uh, very frequently. I meet with um, uh, really all the board members on a regular basis. Uh, and, you know, my goal has been to uh, try and uh, educate uh, board members on the proposals, make sure that they're informed and they can make uh, a good judgment about, uh, about the proposals. You know, at the end of the day, each governor makes his or her own choice about whether to vote for or against uh, a proposal, and I, I respect that. S sticking with this subject of governance, board governance, how, how circumscribed is your authority here vis-a-vis -vis the chair of the board? Where does your authority begin and where does the chair's end, as it, as it might be, on issues relating to bank regulation policy? Well, let me just start by saying that the chair and I have a, a really close relationship. We're uh, based on trust and, and mutual respect. We spend a lot of time together. <laughs> Um, on bank issues, on monetary policy issues. Um, the the Dodd-Frank Act uh, provides a particular statutory role for the vice chair for supervision. Uh, the, the vice chair for supervision is in charge of supervision and in charge of making recommendations to the board on policy matters that need to go to the board for approval. So it's a specific statutory role that that, um, that I have that, that you know, is, is different from the chair's role. But as I said, we, we spend a ton of time together um, and we have a really close relationship. I wanna to get to some of the questions from the audience. W one question here, and I'm not sure I, I'm, I've heard the concept before. What are your thoughts on reverse stress testing? Mm -hmm. So the idea of reverse stress testing is, is basically this. Uh, there are, um, Lots of ways in a, in a stress test that you can run a hypothetical scenario and then see what happens to the bank or to the banking system. You run a recession, what's the loss of capital? The idea of a reverse stress test is very different. It's not about setting capital standards, let me be clear. Um, it's not about um, saying that, that banks need to meet a certain capital test. But the idea is this, let's start from the idea that a bank failed what are the ways that could have happened? So a bank failed, what are its deepest vulnerabilities? 
or what are the kinds of shocks that could hit that bank that would, require, that would end up having it fail? And then once you have that, you can say, oh, that's interesting. Maybe the bank should think differently about a set of risks. Or, or you might say, wow, that would really you know, require such an enormous you know, change in our underlying understanding of the facts. We don't need to worry about that particular risk. So it's a way of using qualitative judgment to help bank uh, risk managers and supervisors better understand the way that an institution might be affected. And the reason this is important, I think, to do or to think about doing is we're, we're as humans, amazing at pattern recognition, like just phenomenal. We start doing it when we're babies and we grow up and it, it keeps us out of a lot of trouble. You know, you know not to put your hand on the hot oven. You learn all kinds of like very basic patterns, but we're not really great at things that don't follow a pattern. And so doing reverse stress testing is a way of getting our heads out of pattern recognition and thinking more broadly about risk. Given the events of this past spring, what have we learned about what is happening to the mid-sized regionals as a group? I mean, this kind of ties back to merger policy, but to have a sensible regulatory policy or merger policy, you have to have a view about their competitive situation. So do the mid-sized regionals uh, simultaneously lack the scale to compete with the big guys, but are still too big to engage in whatever is left of relationship banking. What do you see as kind of the, the competitive structure facing that subset of the industry right now? Well, I, I think, first of all, that our banking system, our financial system, benefits greatly from having a diverse range of sizes and kinds and types of institutions. Large uh, institutions, regional institutions, community banks, and everything in between. Um, and I think that uh, most of the institutions in that uh, wide space uh, between the GSIBs and a community bank are doing incredibly well. Uh, they are serving a wide range of communities. They're meeting the needs of businesses, large and small. They are um, uh, competitive. Uh, they're um, uh, you know, uh, innovative. Uh, and so I'm not worried about the health of that sector of our institutions. I think they are uh, overall very, very strong, um, competitive, innovative institutions. They did get thwacked in, this, in the events of March. Um, and so we're attentive to uh, looking at risks in that sector, of course. And, and as I suggested in my capital remarks, I do think there are some ways in which those institutions' um, capital requirements should be different with respect to the long-term debt requirement. And uh, for example, and, and for another example is the treatment of unrealized gains and losses on securities so that we're uh, ensuring that they have the right level of capitalization. But I'm, I'm quite bullish on them overall. One other point I hear when I talk to bank executives uh, and looking back on the events of this past spring, as they say, some of them have said to me, you know, damage be damned, uh, we really need to get uh, control of inflation because mm -hmm. we fund ourselves in the term market. Mm -hmm. If the long end rises, that'll really put stress on the banks. So uh, turning to monetary policy briefly here, uh, and when you think about where we are in this inflation fight, how much higher are short-term rates going to have to go up uh, for you to feel confident that you're better managing the risks there on inflation? Well, let me start with the, the, the basic fact, which is that inflation is still far too high. Um, and high inflation obviously hurts um, uh, the ability of, of businesses to, to plan. It hurts the ability of uh, individual households uh, to be able to go out and, and get the goods they need and the services they need in a way that, that meets their um, their family's budget. And so we're quite attentive to bringing inflation down to our target of 2%. We've made a lot of progress in monetary policy, the work that we need to do over the last year. Uh, I arrived at the board and we started raising rates at 75 basis point clip. Uh, we moved down to a, a 50 basis point clip and then to a 25 basis point clip. And then at the last meeting, we skipped a meeting. And that's all part of uh, as we get closer and closer to what we think is a sufficiently restrictive level, 
that's part of positioning ourselves so that we can try and get to that target level in a careful way. We're, we're close, uh, but I think you saw from, from our last meeting that, that many participants believe we need to do more. We're going to be uh, very data dependent, uh, meeting by meeting, looking at the data as it comes in. And um, uh, so I, I would say we're close, but we still have a bit of work to do. And ju just to be clear, would you put yourselves, would you put yourself in the many participants? I would put myself uh, without regard to commenting on the, on the SEP. I'll just say for myself, I, I think we're close. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Michael. I think that's all the time we have this morning, but really appreciate it. My pleasure. And we're going to let Michael go, uh, and uh, we'll just take one minute here, stay in your seats, and we'll reset with the next panel. Thanks so much. Michael. Thank you all. I got that. <clears throat> Thanks. All right. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, we'll get started now with the panel. Um, I'm pleased to be joined this morning by Alexa Philo with, the Americans, with Americans for Financial Reform, Andrew Olmem, uh, Mayor Brown, former Deputy Director of the National Economic Council at the White House, and Hugh Carney from the American Bankers Association. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to start by getting maybe your reaction to uh, the proposal that uh, Vice Chair Barr laid out um, just now, uh, what you think works, where you think there's uh, room for improvement. And I'll start down at the end uh, with you, Hugh. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I feel like my name tag should say industry representative, since I was a lot of the arguments I've made over the last few years were referenced quite a few times in those speeches. But uh, overall, I'm still not hearing a convincing justification for adopting Basel III endgame. This was a process that uh, started over a decade ago, really, uh, and was focused on credit, operational, and market risk. Uh, it has nothing to do with Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank, uh, you know, the key attributes there were interest rate risk and liquidity risk. And it really seems like it's recommending knee surgery for wrist injury. injury. It's just not, uh, not really on point. Uh, as they move forward, uh, I am encouraged that uh, there'll be a lot of detail um, uh, about the holistic review in the proposals. However, I would encourage the Fed to issue uh, separately the holistic review for comment. Uh, allow the stakes are high here, so it's very, very important to get it right. And uh, since 2016, ABA has been advocating for an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking because there's a lot of complexities of how these standards could be adopted in the U.S. So that's my initial reaction. Thanks, Andrew Ullman. Yeah, my, my initial reaction is actually on process as well. Is you know, He talks a lot about uh, enhancing the resiliency of the banking system. And I think that's the goal everybody shares, follows banking policy. Absolutely. But what I don't see is uh, the resiliency kind of in the rulemaking process here, because by kind of a little more uh, technical explanation, kind of where I think Hugh's saying is, by going right to an, uh, a notice of proposed rulemaking, that's not giving the regulators a lot of flexibility to make changes um, before they move to final. If they make substantial material changes, then they would have to repropose it again. So the, 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 the easier move would be to do an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, particularly on something as this complicated, com combined with um, a quantitative impact study. He indicated that there is some of that data coming. I think you know, some of that uh, we still have to see but a full quantitative impact study along with that to allow the public and particularly Congress to weigh in and really understand what these uh, rules are gonna be. That was the process that was used for Basel II. And I think if you look back on the Basel II process, having an AMPR and particularly quantitative impact studies uh, were very valuable. Uh, regulators had, were very confident initially about what Basel II would result in in terms of capital. The quantitative impact study suggested significant declines in capital, which was a surprise. You saw Congress react pretty strongly. You saw that suddenly the FDIC changed its position. And you actually had a much more informed process. Uh, it would seem to me here that in terms of process going forward with something as complicated and important and frankly, this is something the Fed and the reg other regulars have to get right, right? This is not something that um, doesn't have real impact on the economy if they get it wrong. To take the time 
to do an advanced proposed rulemaking, do the quantitative impact study, and let the public fully weigh in and understand what they're about to do. Thanks. Alexa. Yes, absolutely. Um, I was um, encouraged uh, by what we heard today. Um, I think there's a level of consistency that we're hearing from our agency leaders on capital. Um, I advocate, we at Grant, uh, <clears throat> Americans for Financial Reform advocate for more capital. Uh, we believe it's really important to have the full set of Basel III reforms, um, finishing uh, all the, the lessons learned uh, from the great financial crisis, uh, you know, in market risk, for example, notably, and op risk. And also, holistically, I feel like it's very important to make sure those lessons learned from 2023 crisis as well. And for us, having the uh, full boot, you know, the full uh, Basel III and the, uh, the full holistic lessons learned from 2023 crisis makes sure that our uh, largest banks are well capitalized and particularly lessons learned on that 100 to 250 billion. And it, that's important to us, particularly given the uh, incentives, uh, the compensation incentives that have been poorly structured and allowing uh, banking executives to pursue outsized uh, business activities uh, and uh, uh, in an inadequately capitalized uh, instance, uh, you're going to have um, the tendency to have outsized business activities, uh, over, overly risky business activities that uh, will contribute to bubbles. Um, so both the incentive comp and certain business practices uh, lead to bubbles. And then we're back where we started in a financial crisis. And we've learned from these financial crises. We've learned from the great financial crisis. Who gets hurt? Uh, we find that Already underserved communities get hurt. Uh, low to moderate income communities get hurt. Rural communities, black and brown communities, and these are these are communities that uh, during the Great Financial Crisis, and if we're not vigilant in the current day, uh, get severely impacted by poorly uh, capitalized banks and by a, a system that is not resilient. And and so for those reasons, I was encouraged. So uh, I want to follow up with you on that. A lot, I know. The question I, I have, uh, I'm thinking back to the experience 20 years ago with the GSEs. You know, everybody was focused on interest rate risk at the GSEs. The problem came in credit risk, right? That was right. what took Fannie and Freddie down. So you mentioned lessons learned from March of 23. If you had to identify, Alexa, you know, the, the two or three most important lessons learned uh, from the SCB events, what sure. are those? Sure. I'm going to quickly, right out of the gate, put the spotlight on uh, uninsured deposits. Of course, that was a very big contribution. And you also had the unrealized losses that weren't, you know, it wasn't, uh, weren't fully being taken into account because of that opt-in uh, arrangement. So those two aspects are really, really important, really uh, important lessons learned, coming, le lessons learned coming off of those. And yet, Capital, capital, capital. Uh, what we saw was uh, when SVB went out and raised, sought to raise more capital, all of a sudden investors and counterparties, all eyes are on what? Is there sufficient capital given uh, the hit they took uh, to their equity in the sale of their securities and their track record of poor management decisions, right? Putting short-term profits before questions about adequate capital and, appropriate, and appropriately, uh, you know, structured compensation. I'd pose the same question to Hugh. Uh, lessons learned, and I guess I should add, uh, you know, to the extent to which these policies you think go towards uh, sure. remediating some of these um, Well, to start off, I would say that the capital rules don't need to do everything. Um, in fact, the GAO, uh, when it did its review of Silicon Valley Bank's failure, uh, encouraged the Federal Reserve to have triggers beyond capital. Uh, and reg regulators uh, for the last few decades have focused on capital, capital, but it doesn't need to do everything. We have an interest rate risk framework. Um, it's important that bank management <coughs> implements that framework, and it's important examiners uh, check that framework and also if there are deficiencies, highlight those deficiencies. We have a liquidity risk framework. Uh, it's important for uh, bank management to implement those. Um, I believe the report found the Federal Reserve indicated that uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank fa failed its liquidity stress test. That issue was not elevated. Um, that was not corrected. 
And so we actually have frameworks designed for some of the risks for Silicon Valley Bank. I view uh, capital as uh, something that, uh, quite frankly, this discussion should not be about. It was really a focus on interest rate risk and liquidity risk. Now, I 100% agree uh, with Alexa, who mentioned that um, having appropriately capitalized institutions uh, is right. High, highly capitalized institutions is the right approach. Uh, banking supports the broader economy. I would say policy may and the most recent stress tests indicate that the banking industry is extremely highly, highly capitalized. Anything to add, Andrew? Well, I mean, <coughs> certainly uh, one, one can always say that if with any bank failure, there should have been more capital, right? I mean, so in a way, it's just kind of self-serving, and I think the analysis is pretty clear that it was a lot more complex than that. Um, ma decisions by management, uh, slowness and pace by regulators. And remember, we still have the prompt corrective action method that is uh, requirements that are in statute that, once again, proved to be pretty ineffective, you know, so um, uh, in the way they are, they're implemented. So I don't really see the argument on, on capital here. Uh, Andrew, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with you here. Uh, any reaction to what uh, Vice Chair Barr proposed on stress testing? Do you see room to improve the stress tests or are they, you know, doing what they were designed to do? Yeah, the stress test should always kind of be continuing uh, to be uh, evolve and to be refined, right? These are very complex um, models. The markets are changing. Our understanding of them is always improving. So certainly we would want to ha have, um, um, have, have refinements to them. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Um, I think the kind of question, though, that we get into is kind of complexity, and it becomes very difficult to really understand what the impact of these changes on stress tests as well as the overall capital changes are going to mean for the real economy and the banking system. Um, you know, there's been a real migration of risk out of the banking system since Dodd-Frank. And we have to kind of ask ourselves, you know, certainly we can keep increasing capital, uh, making our banks so-called safer and safer, but what kind of banks are we going to have? You know, I think the old jokes that I hear is, you know, eventually our banks are going to be money market funds with auto loans. Right, that for a for the world's most advanced economy, that's not the kind of banking system we need. Uh, we need a much more um, uh, diverse banking system that does a lot of more activities. Deposits are a very cheap source of funding that should be deployed uh, very efficiently, and it can really help economic growth, and that benefits everybody. Certainly, capital is important to making sure we have a, a resilient and stable system. Um, but one has to make sure we understand the trade-offs here. And that's why I come back to, you know, we, we certainly need more study and analysis here about what the potential implications uh, are going to be about these, these new rules. Uh, Alex, I, I want to invite you to respond, but I'll, I'll also ask you, um, you know, one of the surprises, perhaps, maybe it wasn't a surprise, a surprise in some places in March was uh, the run from Silicon Valley Bank and other maybe similarly situated banks, those deposits ran to the largest banks, right? This idea was that uh, maybe they're really well regulated, but maybe they're just too big to fail, and so that's where we want to have our money. And so the argument I've heard is, uh, to some extent, the, the Dodd-Frank regime uh, hasn't solved for too big to fail. What do you think the events of March have told us about uh, the, uh, you know, how well Dodd-Frank has performed in terms of managing what it was designed to prevent uh, in, in the form of too big to fail. For sure. Um, I, I do believe that Dodd-Frank set us up uh, very well uh, on, on too big to fail topics. It wasn't perfect. There are plenty of things to have to fix. And yet where I see the real trouble having, you know, started brewing was when uh, the tinkering began uh, with Dodd-Frank. So you had the, um, the legislative change uh, with uh, S2155. And what that did is that essentially defanged uh, for uh, what previously had been uh, firms that had been uh, subject to SIFI standards. And so our view is, is that those changes uh, particularly uh, where the Fed took uh, its rulemaking and, you know, pursued that, you know, that deregulatory agenda, that it's really critical 
to restore certain elements. The capital requirements, for example, in the 100 to 250 billion range is an example. Another example is in, in the stress testing, there were certain aspects of, of the stress testing, of living wells and other complementary tools around capital that were uh, no longer relevant. Uh, and an example, again, is this 100 to 250 billion range. As a result, well, it wasn't really as much Dodd-Frank that created the problems. It was these uh, these sort of deregulatory rollbacks. And I believe, really, and we believe, set us up for SVB, essentially. It was one of the really key factors there. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, so Andrew's shaking his head. You were in the White House from 2017 yeah, to 2020. Yeah, I don't think that... It, that, that uh, this yeah. was in your brief, 2155. Yeah. So first of all, Enhanced prudential standards apply to all institutions above $100 billion who have bank holding company, companies. Uh, the Fed had the option of not having uh, the enhanced prudential standards apply in, uh, to institutions from 100 to 250, and that they, they exercised their discretion to apply. So to say that enhanced prudential standards didn't apply to these institutions is just not accurate. What is interesting, though, is that, remember, Signature Bank did not have a holding company. And hence, it was not subject to enhanced supervision. And that's not because of the uh, 21, that's 2155. That was how Dodd-Frank was written. So if you, if you want to talk about difference in supervision, you have to go actually go back to Dodd-Frank um, if you want to have uh, enhanced, why enhanced supervision wasn't applied to Signature Bank. It had nothing to do at all with S2155 or the Fed's tailoring rules. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time. But before we wrap, and I'll stick with you on this, Andrew, because yeah. you worked in the Senate when Dodd-Frank was passed, you worked in the White House. Over the last 15 years, uh, uh, bank regulation, I don't think it's uh, too editorializing on my part to say it's become more partisan. Yeah. If you look at the rulings from the Supreme Court in uh, Collins v. Yellen, the Celia case, where now regulators can be replaced basically when the new uh, administration takes over, it seems possible that over the next 15 years, bank regulation will become even more partisan. Is that a problem to the extent that you end up with these pendulum swings yeah. in, a, in a kind of macroeconomically important policy zone, or is that just how our political system should work? Listen, I think you, you hit on a really good point. So I think it actually is both. I think where um, regulators can, they really should strive to, to seek bipartisan support. I mean, that's what we did with S2155. Um, certainly, you know, I took <laughs> a lot of grief uh, from people who wanted to go further and thought that um, uh, there are a lot of other reforms that could have been done. But my view is, is that you know, uh, getting a strong bipartisan support behind a bill makes those reforms uh, durable. That's what we've seen. If you go back to the whole history of banking regulation, is that when you pass legislation with strong, good bipartisan margins, it remains durable, and that's generally good for the system. And also, you tend to more likely get it right. Um, so that's one, one piece. So, and I think when we, you know, relating it now to these capital um, requirements, that's why I think it's really important to have uh, a longer process and a thorough process to make sure Congress can get on board with what the reforms are, are going to be here. Because otherwise, going to your point, you're going to see this back and forth on whether it be these capital standards or very or pieces of them, um, and that's not kind of healthy for the system. Now. Certainly, the political system will always uh, and should have the ability to weigh in. And when there's a change in the pre uh, presidency, in my view, it's very appropriate to have the president's regulators um, kind of reflect his views through, through appointments. And you've seen, frankly, you know, um, President Biden be very aggressive about replacing regulators um, um, uh, who were not of his party um, in a way that you actually didn't see before. So we. I think this administration has really set the precedent for exactly what you're talking about, is that we're going to now see much bigger swings in the regulators more quickly. Now, that usually happens anyways over time, but it's going to happen faster. That comes back to, as regulators move forward, though, if um, they want to have their reforms be durable, really building out that uh, bipartisan support is, is essential going forward. Hugh. I think we're in an environment where we're seeing the regulatory pendulum becoming a regulatory metronome. Is that good? Probably not for long-term planning. And Alexa. 
Um, I, I absolutely uh, would, uh, would want to see increased uh, uh, bipartisanship. I, I think the challenge I worry about is, um, you know, that, you know, as, as an examiner, but just also seeing cycle after cycle of, of crisis of, over, you know, decades, that to a certain extent bipartisan, you know, is, is has to deal with the bank lobby. And, and what we've seen is, um, you know, you know, CEOs and executives' compensation is not yet appropriately structured, uh, and there are, um, you know, um, act rules and, uh, and and regs around certain markets um, allowing uh, potential bubbles to grow. So what you end up with is the repeat and getting back where we are with failed firms and a lack of resilience. And again, that hurts the communities we care about, uh, the underserved, uh, black and brown communities, rural communities, access to... And, and so those are the priorities that we, we see. And that means appropriately robust capital in the system and in individual banks. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to, to remain with me for a minute. And John Sarushian, uh, Senior Associate Director from the Bipartisan Policy Center, is going to uh, uh, wrap us up here. Thank you. And can people hear me? Is the microphone on? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm John Sarushian. I'm Senior Associate Director for Business and Technology. Just wanted to close the event by thanking our moderator and our excellent panel. Uh, I also want to thank the Vice Chair, uh, who has already left, but thank him for making his remarks and doing the Q&A. Uh, want to thank our internal uh, team and our vendors for making this event possible. There are too many people to thank uh, in that regard to sort of list them out, but just want to thank all of them. Uh, we heard a very interesting discussion around uh, bank capital and issues of financial regulation. Uh, BPC has been working on these issues for over a decade now, and we look to continue uh, on these issues going forward. We also are interested in sort of looking more into the intersection of technology and financial services as part of this. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone who came here today. Uh, you guys are the ones who make this event possible. Uh, so thank you all, and hopefully you guys can join us again next time. Thank you.